What's up everybody, Nelson and Rose here from Get Set Tennis and today we are gonna teach you how to string a racket. Okay, so a question we get asked all the time is how do you actually string a racket? And I always say, ask Rez. <laughs> uh, Rez has all the qualifications, so he is actually a master stringer technician, correct? That is correct. So what that means is Rez had to pass a whole bunch of exams, a physical, ex a physical? Did you pass a physical? Yes. <laughs> How long can you sit in a chair? <laughs> I got it. He had to pass a bunch of tests, people would come down, watch him string, and since then he's also strung for a bunch of professionals. When the Australian Fed Cup team came down here to Canberra to take on the Ukraine, Rez was the official stringer for the Australian team. He strung the rackets for Dasha Gavrilova, Casey Delacqua, and world number one, Ash Barty. Go Australia. Rez, what can we expect in your little tutorial today? Well, we're gonna go from A to Z in the whole stringing world of things, from the machine to the racket to the choice of strings and the whole technique. Let's go. Can you just say a few words? Just so I can tech test the mic. Oh yes. Uh, the string goes through the hole. Thank you. Okay everyone, here we are at the Get Set headquarters and I'm gonna string a racket on our new Wilson Bayada light machine. It's a new updated version of the original, which was a state-of-the-art machine. They just sort of trimmed the fat a little bit on the on the details, so no more electronic up and down, but it is a constant pull machine used for commercial use, all the high-tech gadgets. So as the machine's warming up, we've got our key tools here, clippers. This one is very important, it's our starter clamp. Okay, we have our pliers for sort of those tricky areas where the fingers don't fit. Uh, we also have uh, our Allen keys for other adjustments on the machine. Other than that, we are ready to go. Before I cut the strings out, I studied the racket, make sure I know the string pattern. This one here is a 16 by 19, an old classic BLX uh, Wilson uh, blade. When I cut the strings, I do a plus sign cut. I start from the center or nearest to the break, and then I will go into a sort of up and down motion. So I'll start in the center, if you can see that. Or maybe I'll do a couple up here. Try to minimize how much the racket is popping. If you have a pair of garden shears, they are amazing to cut the strings with, because all you'll have to do there is literally go straight down the center, up there, and across in one quick go. And then I'll do the old push out here. Have all the loops sitting on the outside just for efficiency to get things out. God, it looks cool, doesn't it? Ooh. You're a dog. Yep, I'm gonna go off camera here just to pour it into the bin. Let's not film the bin, shall we? What do we have for lunch? Oh, we were gonna have- Reza! Oh. Have you been cheating on your diet again? That wasn't me, that was Buster. All right, we set the racket up now. You know, rackets are really cool these days. They do have sort of symbols on where the racket needs to be. This one doesn't, because this is a special one by Mr. Frawley. Limited edition blade. I'll go finger tight on the stirrups here to hold the center of the racket. Then I will go Nice and firm on the outside with these six points on the side here, the other four. And then I'll go a little quarter turn extra just to make sure she's nice and snug. And so how, how tight do you want your racket fitting into the machine before you start stringing? You want it fairly tight. So like I said, finger tight here first, palm tight on the, the side components, and then another quarter turn once you've completed that. That'll keep the racket nice and snug. Yep, that Good. ain't going anywhere. Next thing we do, set the tension, okay? We're gonna set this for 52 pounds, a nice uh, steady tension here, so a nice digital display on the old Wilson Bayardo. Measuring, like I said before, I checked the racket before, 16 mains, so that means I'm gonna go 16 across. There are people who like to measure string by doing arm lengths and things like that. I prefer one by one, because I don't wanna to waste too much string. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Anytime you hesitate, a little extra just for the knots, or you're not sure of the string length, do it again, okay? Because if you want to check twice, do it once. And the last thing you want is to run short of string. Once you've cut your string, okay, always cut at a little bit of an angle to create a little bit of a sharp edge, makes it easier to weave through the racket. This is now my main string, so I'm gonna use this for the mains, the ups and downs of my racket, which I do first. I'm gonna start at the bottom here because I have what's called four loops, all right? That's an even number of loops, so I want to loop up the top. Give myself a bit of slack, create the loop down the bottom, 
And as you can see, the four loops at the bottom and the main loop is at the top of the racket. Once I finish that up, I even it out. Oh, I got a little bit of a kick there, no? All good. There we go. I have now eight for this side and eight for this side. Okay, and so why do you always want to start your stringing from the middle of the racket rather than the edge? Well, it's just for stability and sort of structural integrity of the racket. So you always want to start from the center of, of these things. This is the starter clamp. I told you this is your best friend in the situation. So your starter clamp goes on the outside of your frame on the string you're gonna pull. The string I'm first gonna pull, you have to watch this one, this is where it gets tricky. I'll push up the top here because I never ever double pull. I always pull one string at a time. This is a loop around machine through. There's my tension. The racket is pulling, the uh, machine is pulling the tension. I'm gonna clamp as close as I can to the frame without getting too, too close. Top clamp, base clamp, good to go. This string has now got and holding its tension. The tension is always held between the clamp and the machine, or clamp to clamp. And there we go. You can see that extra tension is pulling quite a lot there. I've got to give it time to make sure it's at its correct tension. So just really quickly, give us a run through. I noticed you loop the string around here. What? How do you make this happen? <laughs> okay, so I'm going through again. I'll do another demonstration of the machine working. Make sure I go around there. So here I go, I'm going around the loop. Okay, it's to stabilize the string so it stays in its, its direction. And I press the device here and the machine, I pull it a little bit on an angle so this grips the string and holds it. So there, this is a little like almost gap there. Kind of like a gripper thing, so yeah. You need to wedge the string in there, then you can pull the trigger. Correct, I release the clamp, up I go, tighten the base, solid. Press the button, the string is released. Now I've done a couple on this side, I wanna start going on the other side. I try to keep it even from left to right. I don't wanna go all this, cause then all the tension is held on this side of the racket. I wanna try and keep it even on both sides. So I'm gonna start on the other side. I'm gonna pull this tension here. So now the starter clamp is separated from the frame. Take this off, nervously, even though I've done this a thousand times. Release the clamp, top and bottom, as close as I can to the frame without obstructing the machine. And there we go. Okay, so as you can see here, Rez trying to keep this symmetrical is working one way and then making sure that he's getting the same amount of strings as the other side. So that keeps that even balanced and doesn't put too much pressure on one side of the racket. Correct, Rez? Correct. Well done, Nelson. Thanks, man. I'm learning. So Rez is going to continue to do the mains, which you always do first. And then when he gets to the end of the main, he's going to do a little bit of a tie-off. Look at you go. Cruising through. Okay, so the clamp's so important. As you can see, Rez taking off the clamp here. But once you're on a roll, once you get moving, you can only release this clamp if the string is pulled and holding tension. If you release this clamp while the string is not in this, what's this thing called? Tension head. Tension head. Then you will lose all the tension throughout the entire string. So it is very important that your clamp is holding the tension whilst you do not have it in the head, the head clamp? Head clamp? Tension header. Tension header. It's confusing. So now we're on the knot string, the final one. There is a button on your machine that has a little picture of a knot here. So I'm gonna press that. You'll notice the number's gonna change. Jumped up five pounds of pressure, five pounds of tension. That is just to cover that little gap we can't clamp. So I'm gonna do that, the string through. I've just got enough. There's my 57 pounds, not my 52. Reclamp and release. Find the grommet, the chunkiest one there with a nice gap, and it's the closest. That is where I'm gonna tie off my knots. That's where the pliers might come in handy. So how would you use the pliers to help you get through a tough hole like Because this? my fingers kind of slip and push through, I use the, the pliers here to create that little bit of a shorter jab there. It's just easy to push the string through in these tighter spots because my fingers are just too chunky. Like sausages really, aren't they? So, knot time. Over the string, through the gap. My knots are very old school. So I go through here and this is what the knot will look like. I use my Start a clamp because it is easy to grip the string without me having to hold it tight. So I will put the string in the starter clamp, grip nicely and nice and relaxed. I'm going to pull away and then back towards me to have the knot nice and tight. Away and nice and tight. And I'll push my fingers and just try and keep the knot as small as possible. Like I said, I'm old school. There are other variations of knots out there. I like the old double knot. I'll do it again, around and through, start a clamp, 
grip away and back. And there we go, that knot is not coming undone. When do you cut the remaining access? All this stuff here, <laughs> you leave it on. So do it again. <laughs> when, when do you cut <laughs> <laughs> It's the excess. Access, when do you cut the access? Uh, so really quickly, when do you cut the excess string? We'll get to there in just a second. I'm going to leave it because I'm kind of paranoid. You know what I mean? So I'm going to wait until I complete both knots. So I've got to do the other side now. Round through, start a clamp, grip towards. Good. The mains are completed. I now release the clamps. These two will lose a little bit of tension. A small gap between clamp and the knot, that's the five pounds. Oh, <gasps> drop it down. Now I can cut confidently because the string is holding, the knots are holding the tension. I will cut halfway between the knot and the top of the frame and I will try to cut on an angle because I don't like players cutting their fingers. Here, so I cut slowly, and there's the cut, and you can see it's nice and flush against that. That is a good one. Squish, nice and flush, and the mains are done. Oh, that was pretty. Beautiful. Let's do the crosses. So I'll check the racket. It says 16 by 19, so 19 crosses. All right, here we go. So one, two, three, four. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to do the crosses two pounds less than the mains. The reason for that is because when you're hitting top spin shots, your mains are basically cutting, sorry, your cross is actually cutting the mains. So if you go a little bit less, you don't lose much performance or any performance to be honest, but you gain in durability. So the strings will last a little bit longer. Okay, now one of my biggest concerns about going with the crosses is how to start, especially when you're two-piece stringing. I get very confused on where to tie, where to start. So break it down. How do you start across in two-piece stringing? Okay, we're gonna go the easy way. We'll start from the top. So I'll go through the top cross hole here. I'm gonna go over the highest string or under the lowest string. So see, this one was quite high. If I went under, it's too easy. I'm gonna go over the tough one. So always go against the grain. Remember that, against the grain. The weaving is tricky. We'll get into that a little bit later. Basically, one finger above it and below, and I'm literally going over and under all the way. I'm gonna go nice and slow so you can see that. I've completed the first cross, there it is. Go through this hole here. I need enough here to reach the machine. This is where you don't use the loop here because you don't wanna use so much string here because you start wasting too much. So I'm gonna go just enough there. I can see that's gonna fit, so I'm confident in that. Start a clamp, start a clamp on the outside can now pull this tension because the starter clamp's holding the other end. So just to be clear, you're gonna leave this starter clamp on for the first how many strings? I use leave it for the first three. You can leave it all the way to the end. It's kind of up to you, but I do it for the first three because I prefer having the knot there instead of the starter clamp. Just because you feel it's more safe? Preference, yeah. I get paranoia. Yeah, you, know, you never know. Okay, and we're off. So this is one of the important parts as people when they first start stringing too is when you start weaving back on the crosses, you have to go opposite, correct, Res? Correct, so very simple trick here. Because this one here is over, when I get to this string here, I'm gonna make sure I go under. That means this one here, I'm gonna have to go over. So around I go over and then under, that is the opposite pattern like a checkers board or a chess board if you're more intelligent. And why is that? What would happen if you went the same pattern the entire way down? Well, the strings would be able to move too much. You wouldn't have that condensed pattern that creates that, that nice feel and brush on the strings when you're playing tennis. So it just is better to create that stability and holding the tension together. Now, here's another part. When I'm pulling the crosses through the mains here, like I said, the mains are going to be cut by the crosses throughout tennis when you're hitting top spins and slices and stuff like that. So what I do when I pull my, my string through is I will move it constantly, not pulling too fast, move it constantly so it never ever cuts the same area or, or brushes against the same area. If I just went like this really fast, you can see it's gonna go directly into the string. That will reduce its longevity, how long the string will last, its endurance. Here's another say, uh, little quick tip here when you're doing crosses, feed one string ahead. It makes the feeding a lot easier for some reason. So, so what do you mean by that? So once you- So I've done this one here and I haven't tensioned this one, but I'm gonna leave it loose. I'm gonna go ahead and do the next one. So I'm stringing, I'm feeding or weaving one ahead. Weave one ahead. There it goes, pulling through. I made sure I'm the opposite 
I am good, looking good. I'll pull the string through, making sure I move it. And now I will pull the tension. So you're just leaving enough through this little loop area where you can pull it on the, what is it called again? Tension header. Tension header. <laughs> So then you can get the tension for the previous one that you put through. Correct. And then you will refeed, and that just gives you that little bit of uh, slack on the string. Correct. To make it easier to weave. And this is just for me, because I like it, it makes it easier to weave. It doesn't mean you have to do this. You can do weave one, pull one, it's totally fine. But I prefer this method because it just makes it quicker and easier when you have to do a lot of rackets in a row. All right, I'm at the point now where I'm going to tie the knot for the crosses, okay, at the start. So I've got my starter clamp at the moment. I wanna get rid of that and put the knot. So, remember that little bit I left at the machine? I'm gonna put that in there. Where's my knot button? Boop, there it is. This is tricky because it's not coming out the side here. I'm gonna push this up. It is now gripped by the machine. Then I'll press the button. Now, it seems really scary, even after a thousands of rackets. It's still a bit scary. Release the clamp, don't fail me now. Moving the clamp from one to the next position up. And the reason I did that extra five pounds, I'm about to tie a knot. Through we go, the knot procedure. String, grip, away, towards, double it up. Everyone, weaving. It's all about personal preference, but this is my favorite way, the best way to weave. Under and over, so that what that means is my one hand is underneath the machine or under the racket, other hand is on top. I get a little bit of slack and I will up and down as I go through. If I have troubles gripping the string, I'll just push it through a little bit more. As you get to the bottom of the rack, it becomes more difficult, but there. That is my favorite way. Some people like to go long and do some other funky stuff. They're all good. It's up to you. That is the reservoir. way. Okay, so as we start to get to the back end of the string, is there anything we need to start thinking about to, before we tie off? Well, I didn't mention this before, but what you want to do as you're tensioning your string you wanna make sure it's nice and straight. Strings like to curve in its natural order because it's, it's pulling and sort of rubbing some friction against the mains. So when you're pulling in the machine here, as I'll show you on this one, you'll see it'll tend to go down a little bit. I'll just make sure that is straight, nice and straight. And I'm comfortable and happy with the straightness of that. So the tension is true. Release, good machine. All right, last one. You know the procedure. Knot button, around we go. Clamping. Release the machine, find the closest, most comfortable, biggest grommet to feed through. Oh, we've got a tricky one here. And then, here we go. Oh, tricky little sucker, isn't it? There we go, got him. Let's really help him out a little bit. There you go, buddy. The fact that I'm very close to the clamp, not a big deal, so long as you've got room to work. Start a clamp grip, grip the handle, another one. A little bit of muscle to finish it off. Releasing the clamps. Oh. We now do the cuts, halfway up and an angle. Quick trick on that one, toe clippers are also a really good tool to have to get that, that kind of flush edge up against the frame. Strings look nice and straight, top and bottom off. Racket is good to go. Okay, top three tips on when picking a string machine for yourself. One, try an electronic version please, okay? It's a constant pull, it's better for the racket and much better for the tension. If you can't do that and you want to go a little cheaper, drop weight is the way to go, not those twisty clamp ones. Second tip, always have, and they all are these days, a six point control head. So that means that the racket is held on the machine by six points. Two here at the front, top and bottom, and also on the sides, around two and 10, and four and eight o'clock on the racket. Final thing, string for purpose. If you're deciding to do your own kind of string business, you'll need something a little more commercial that can handle the load. If you are doing it for your personal self, then that's where you can go a little cheaper. Those machines are very good, they just only can handle a certain amount of jobs per day. So keep that in mind when selecting your machine. Okay, three main tips for stringing rackets, okay? First of all, study the racket before you cut the strings out. It's really important you know the string pattern of the racket. Two, check twice, do it once. On any activity or any technique we do, always do that. Check twice, do it once. Third and final tip, Precision. If it's not done correctly, start again or redo that section again, okay? Because it will, you will feel it on the court when you're playing. Thank you so much for joining us here at Getzer Headquarters. I hope you learned something about string and rackets. If you really enjoyed the video, please make sure you leave a comment, uh, ask any questions you like. 
Don't forget to subscribe. Click on that subscribe button below. Click that subscribe button below. Well done, Rez. My first time. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye. Yep. <laughs>